Hello, I'm Louise Jameson. This is the Sirens of Audio. I'm just delighted to be back here again. Hello. Hey. Hey. Huh? What? What are you doing? I'm listening to the latest Sirens of Audio podcast. Why? What are you doing? I'm watching the latest Sirens of Audio podcast. Have you subscribed and hit the notification bell yet? No, but I will. Have you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts? No, but I will. Good. Good. Okay. Can I get back to the podcast now? As long as I can get back to the video version now. Good. Good. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip. How's things? Things are great. How are things for you? Very, very good. Uh, I'm very excited because this instalment of the podcast was originally supposed to be an episode of We've Got Randomoids. However... It has changed drastically, uh, and it is now a standalone episode. We've got stars. We have got stars, so we had to do something special for that. And, uh, of course, we're not just the, uh, the, po- the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who. We also explore other things from time to time, and today we are going to look in depth at The Omega Factor, which is a TV series from 1979 that was revived by Big Finish with one of the original actors, Louise Jameson, uh, and John Dorney in the lead roles. And we're going to talk to both of them later in the episode. So that is something that is, well, it was very exciting when I found out about that. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun because they they both get on really well together and it'll be hard to get a word in, I think. Very good. But before we get to them, do you know what, Philip? No, what, Dwayne? We need to jump down the rabbit hole... Let's go. <laughs> All right. I'm giving you one each way there, Philip. I was going to say you're... So, um... <laughs> so today in the rabbit hole, uh, I want to talk about, because the Omega Factor is is known as probably one of Big Finish's scariest shows that they make, uh, I want to know from you what you think. Uh, the vital ingredients, they could be all vital ingredients, but what is most important on audio to make it really, really scary for the listener? What do you think? I think it's two things. It's silence and it's noise, <laughs> which seem kind of contradictory. I think um, for audio, you just need the right sort of pacing. So different things create fear. So certainly the right setup, so you need a good setup, you need to feel the mood, but then the mood gets really emphasized well by good sound design and good music. Um, not necessarily tuned for music, but certainly ambient music. But the more the sound design can create a setting, the more the fear can grow. So you do need good acting, you need to know, have characters who you can relate to, can care about, who are in danger. But then to build the fear with that sort of background noise, it's like an ambience sometimes is I think what is what really creates the fear. So, and then you, then you just need dramatic moments and build up. So different things can be quite fearful. Sometimes a lot of noise, a lot of screaming can be quite, quite fearful, but also just that quietness too can really just create tension and build up slowly. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. There are certain elements that, I find on audio extremely scary, uh, but depending on how I'm listening to it as well. For instance, if I'm listening to, I find these days I'm, I much prefer listening to audio with headphones because I get 
I get le- far less distractions. So if I'm listening in the car, I notice these days that I miss a lot of things. So if I re-listen to something, I go, oh, I didn't hear that when I was listening to it in the car. Now, I think a good example, if, if you haven't heard the Omega Factor, but you are a big Finnish listener, a good example of a really good use of sound design to scare uh, in Doctor Who, particularly the Doctor Who range, one story that always stands out to me is uh, Skirtso. Uh, there is only the two actors in that story, how, and so the sound design has to carry that whole story. And there are some moments in there that uh, actually make me physically jump with fright, so I get the jump scares. Um, and the Omega Factor is similar. There are a, a couple of things in the Omega Factor that that really do it for me. Um, the The sound is very intense in the ears, but there's also there is also a music that Nick Briggs does in in the early box sets. Because I don't think he, is he doing the music on the on the one that's coming up. I can't remember, but he does a music that's more. It's different to anything else he does, uh, because even the TV series didn't really have much music in it that, uh, if any, that I that I that I heard. Yes, there's music in the visual series, and yes, it's Nicholas Briggs still doing the music for this new one as well. Still doing it. Yeah, well, I'm pleased about that because in the the box set series one that we that we were listening to for the randomoids. Um, I was very pleased with the combination that the sound designer and Nick Briggs as a musician put together. It was extremely atmospheric. And it had that, when you say ambience, it was like a, it was like a, a hum going through the whole sort of story that, uh, that, that there was, there was an, always an ever present threat in your ears and you were just waiting for the jump scares to come. And inevitably they did, but you just weren't sure when, because they always had that sort of tension like pulled really tight throughout the whole show. And the music was kind of part of the sound design. Does that make sense? Do it you... does. You know, no, yeah. I mean, a, a good sound design and music work hand in hand together. Um, it's, it's, there's so many different elements that actually make something scary. So sometimes it's stillness and quietness. Sometimes it's screaming and jump scares. Sometimes um, it's entire churches falling down and the noise of bells. So there's a whole range of things that people can do. And one of the things about the Mega Factor that's so effective is it actually uses every trick over the course of the stories to actually... Yeah, you get the lot. To, to build that fear and to be concerned and you know, confusion. And yeah, it's, it really captures all that horror and fear so well, which why it's, you know, for people who haven't heard, there's a new um, movie-length episode coming out on Halloween. So they do, Halloween's they're often their spot big finish uses for something scary. And this time they're going for a new Omega Factor. Yes. So on that note, let's crawl up out of the rabbit hole and we'll talk briefly for a minute about the first, let's talk about the first box set because I've listened to the whole box set um, in preparation for Randomoids, which was, <laughs> which was changed. I would have liked to have heard all three box sets before our chat with um, Louise and, and John, but um, I was very pleased to be able to listen to these four episodes. That's for sure. So, but before we talk about that, and I'm going to, I'm going to run the trailer for this um, just before we bring Louise and, and John on. So you'll get a, you'll get a sense of the trailer, um, or get a sense of the story through the trailer then. But Philip, tell us about the Omega Factor, the story, because you have a clear memory of it as a kid. Uh, what was it about the Omega Factor that appealed to you? Well, certainly the reason why I watched it was because Louise James was in it and anything she was in, I watched. So I watched this, I watched Tenko that she was in next, I watched Bergerac. Um, I do get sort of hooked on certain actors and I just follow them. And no matter what they do, I just follow their career. And yeah, Louise James was certainly one of those people that I always followed her career and anything that she was in, I watched. watched. Um, Certainly, it was, was, was inappropriate for me to watch as an 11 year old. So, it first screened in Australia in 1980. It was heavily edited. I do remember having now watched it several times on DVD, and what I've watched again in the last week. Um, there are scenes that weren't in the original production, but it was still scary enough. And it was, it was actually on quite late at night. So, it must have been on at, I think, either nine o'clock. I think it was, I've got the feeling it was nine o'clock on the ABC on mm-hmm. Friday nights. So it was, I was allowed to stay up for it because my father let me, because I begged and pleaded 
which really, there's no way I would let one of my kids at 11 watch this. Watch this show. Um, just shows I managed to get away with all sorts of murder when I was a kid. Um, Omega, Omega's the final. I think, I think the whole thing is you know, the other. Omega's the final letter in the Greek alphabet, and this is all about examining the paranormal. So going beyond Omega. So that's why it's called the Omega Factor. That's where the, the title comes from. And so it's very interesting it was, that it's to do with a letter, isn't it? And they had a an American show that was similar later on with a letter in the title too. The the X Files. So X Files. It's, yeah. It's the X Files was a little bit different because that sort of dealt with uh, a broader range of paranormal stuff, like even aliens and things like that. Whereas the Omega Factor is is clearly rooted in just the paranormal, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it had the potential to go further, and I think when it was set up, it was designed to allow. I mean, it was written with a lot of different writers, different scenarios. There was an overarching theme, and and there was certainly. Um, a plot line that worked throughout the stories and certain characters ended up betraying people along the way. So it was designed, it was, it was actually a very early show which actually had that arc, a story arc going on. But then each, there was individual stories which were quite almost individual in their own right. And it, they're quite different so that there's a slightly different tone, there's a slightly different threat in each story, which just did show that there was a lot of potential. Um, it, it certainly was expected to go on more than one season, but it received a lot of complaints from Mary Whitehouse and her and her listener's guide um, managed to do what they couldn't do with Doctor Who, which was shut it down because they they just said it was you know, too evil. Um, and you know, they, they were saying a lot more demonic than that. It really doesn't quite go in those areas. It certainly goes into the paranormal. It sort of goes into mind control and and there's a different world out there of sorts. Um, but yeah, they, they took a great offense to it and managed to shut it down, which is a bit sad because it had a lot of potential to go for a lot longer and do a lot more. So it's, it's good that the, um, big finish picked it up. And once again, they've, they've brought out 12 episodes. So they've done more than the, what well, about to be 13. They've done more than the TV series managed to do as is often their way. Well, and there's a few audio books too, isn't there? That Louise has read. That's right. So, so she, she, she did the original, uh, audio book that, that Jack a Gerson, is it? Yes. Or Gearson, right? Um, which is based loosely on the on the first episode and and uh, a few other things. Well, it's, uh, it's, but- actually, it's actually it's interesting. I remember I have the book, and I remember reading the book as a eleven, twelve year old. And there's a lot of scenes in that book that still aren't in the series, but are still etched in my mind because the book actually starts right. with the main character as a nine, ten year old, um, and he's having visions, he's seeing things, his his, his parents bring him. A psychiatrist to talk to him through, and um, so he has this big session with this psychiatrist who visits his home. And as he's leaving, the psychiatrist says, oh, "I'll see you next week." And the boy says, "No, I won't." And he says, "Oh, what? Don't you want to see me again?" They said, "Oh, no, I like you. I want to see you, but, but you won't be back next week." And then, as he's driving home, there's this scene where the, a truck in front of him, carrying metal poles, hits a car in front, and one of the metal poles flies through and straight through his chest. And there's just this line in the book about the fact that he died with a look of surprise on his face as he realized that this kid had predicted what was coming next. And that's how the whole book starts with this terrifying scene. And so that, that whole book is still etched into my mind really powerfully. Cool. All right. So when Big Finish took it on, um, they decided to not recreate the the time period that the original series was set in, but they they pushed it forward thirty years. Um, good decision, great decision. Which it, yeah. it's interesting because they tend they don't usually do this. They usually, you know the prisoners sit back, the Avengers. Most most of the shows that they buy the rights to, they actually recreate in the period. So this was a very unusual choice to actually bring it to the modern time. But they had um, Louise, who was who was who was keen to do it. Uh, but the lead actor for the Omega Factor is it James Hazeldean? Yep, he died. Uh, had passed passed away in two thousand and two. Yep, very young. Um, and so it may have been strange to sort of recast him and have Louise as original cast member at at the time. So yeah, it was it was a good decision, I think, to uh, to set it forward thirty years and have John Dorney playing Tom Crane's son Adam, and. Uh, and so I guess the first story in the box set, which is called From Beyond by Matt Fitton, uh, is sort of setting up the relationship between John Dorney's character and 
uh, Louise's character. And her name is Anne. Dr. Anne Dr. Reynolds. Anne, Anne Reynolds, yes, that's right. Um, can, can I say so, that, that you really, part of the reason why I just slightly throw me is that Louise doesn't sound her age at all. And so even though I know she's now playing a woman, and you know, Dr., playing the character in her 60s, yeah. I often struggle to hear that she's in her 60s because she still just doesn't sound that way. And, you know, and there's even times, that, you know, I know she ends up taking much more like a mother relationship with John Donnie's character. But you actually, you think, oh, you know, you could actually feel that there could be some sexual tension there between those two, even though the age span doesn't quite work. Yeah. So yeah, that that first episode is establishing the the characters. Um, the second story called "The Old Gods" by Phil Mulrine, um is is a great piece for T Terry Malloy. I think I think he plays a a, a great character there. Um, and it's a probably refreshing for, although Terry does play lots of different roles for Big Finish, but he's known mostly for Davros. So I guess it's nice to get out of the mask from time to time and play something different. Mm. But he's playing something equally as malicious, if not more so, uh, than um, than, Dav than Davros in this one. So um, it was, it was did you enjoy that story? I do. It was a bit Buffy-esque. Mm -hmm. So there's there's certain moments where, where and in fact, some of the the plot twist towards the end there is a yeah you know, there's a it, it's a, there's a few scenes from Buffy. I thought oh that sort of connects with things that had happened in Buffy, which you know once again huge legacy of a show with seven seasons of twenty four episodes. Is that where summer. you were saying that the, the there were places that the TV series didn't really go to that extreme where this was starting to go? That's right. So, right. I, so I think it had a different level of flexibility. And just I mean, once again, this, this is part of the fear of here is, you know, it's a locked off community, middle of nowhere, no reception. And so you've got the characters very much isolated and there's there's nothing to protect them except for where they are and their own wits. And so it's, it's a very clever character piece, but you also have a couple of very strong characters. Terry Malloy's character is excellent. And then you have a couple of twists with other characters who are there, which, you know, you don't quite see coming. And then you sort of go, ah, oh, okay. And so, yeah, he's managed to throw a few red herrings in and then throw, throw you off the plot. And then, you know, the big baddie happening as well. So and there's, there's actually there's levels of badness that happen both in humans and with the paranormal. Yes. The third story in the set's called Legion. And I kind of, by the stage I, I got to the end of the old gods, I thought, yes, I know what Legion's going to be about. Um, so that was... I, I don't know. Was this the scariest story of the set, do you think? I actually found the Hollow Earth, the fourth season, one the, the scariest. Did you? I, yeah, I think, yeah, I think I did. Um, I, I got, I got so, caught, so caught up in that fourth story. But this one, what, this one was scary because, once again, the characterization is just so well done. Um, and it's just a, there's a character, the, the main protagonist in this story is just so wicked. And what she's doing... Um, on both a human level and then on a paranormal level, both of them le those levels are just awful. And, and it also introduces a character um, in the original TV series was a character called Morag, um, who's actually played by Jack Gerson's daughter Natasha, um, their daughter Natasha, who is in a number of episodes. She's actually responsible for, for the death of um, the, the main character's wife in the first episode. She just appears in front of a car and he swerves to miss her and dies. Um, and so she's a regular character in this in different episodes throughout the TV series. And here they bring her back um, in a comatose state, but she's able to mind project to Tom. And so that's how she's able to talk because in the original series, she doesn't talk at all. Um, they talk about yeah. her being Muse. And I, I don't know that she is, I didn't feel like she was Muse in the original series. I just- She just she, didn't talk. She just didn't talk. I don't know. Maybe she was mute. Didn't, it still doesn't That's the impression I got when I, when I saw her. That she just doesn't talk episodes. as opposed to mute. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's how I felt. So I, I felt like she could talk if she wanted to, just she doesn't. Um, but in here, she then has a connection with Adam where she's actually able to talk in, in to, to each other because they the special powers that they have in her head. And so she becomes a, a substantial character um, and having a, a lot of you know, things happening in the story. And she's going to play a huge role over the next couple of box sets. So, so did we mention... Um, who Department Seven was, no, uh, and how that uh, and how that works into the story. So, 
Um, do you want to explain that to us, Philip? Because you've been watching the episodes and taking in all the box sets, so everything's probably very clear in your mind. Yep. So Department 7 is uh, an organ- a part of government. So the, the British government realises the fact that mind control and the paranormal is real and that every country is investigating how to connect with the paranormal with mind control. And so Department 7 is set up by the British government to try and lead the way in terms of understanding these concepts. And so Dr. Anne Reynolds is one of the doctors. Um, originally, she was just under a number of other characters in the TV series who is doing research into the paranormal. And so this is now 35 years later. She's now head of the department because everyone has died or gone. Um, and so she's now in charge of Department 7. But at the start of the box set, it's felt like Department 7 hasn't achieved much. And so the government's decided to close it all down, that you know, there's no longer a threat from other countries in terms of mind control and con- taking over people. And so we don't need this organization. But during the course of this box set, departments, and when Adam comes, who has got these special powers, um, like his father did, Department 7 starts to revitalize and become more important in terms of, okay, we do need to keep researching what's going on. And maybe they might have some military access. So di- different characters have different purposes. Um, Anne Reynolds is very much just research for the sake of research. She's a scientist. But there's other characters who are seeing the potential to weaponize the research that she's doing. And that becomes one of the storylines that happen in future box sets. Yep. Yeah, so that's that's basically the the, the story behind it. Um, Tom Crane, the original character from the TV series, was a was a journalist, wasn't he? So he was he was looking into these things, but then when uh, when the government discovered he had these paranormal powers, they sort of uh, roped him into investigating these uh, occurrences too. Yeah, well, so Tom Tom was investigating a, a man called Drexel, who was yep. also unbelievably powerful and. There was evil in there. Responsible for the death of his wife, so responsible for his wife, and that actually that character ends up having a, a role to play, or his storyline has a role to play in future box sets. Oh, okay. The, the, the big bad comes back, kind of. Is that right? Because mm. originally played by Cyril Luckham, and I could, I was watching him, and I was thinking, oh, "There's the White Guardian." <laughs> yeah, being totally evil now. <laughs> That's it. Um, okay, we talked about uh, Legion. Um, let's talk about the story that that you said was the scariest to you, The Hollow Earth, interestingly written by Ken Bentley. You don't see his name on the writer's credit too often. He's usually directing, no. and he and incidentally does direct all of these. Yep. Uh, the all box sets, not just the first one. Um, so tell us about what you like about this story. I think why why it's so scary for me. It's compressed in terms of very small cast. It's all, it's done in real time. And that's, so the whole, it's an hour story and it just starts off bit by bit. It's all set in a Gothic church and bit by bit characters enter. So there's five characters in all and they're becoming more and more terrified by what's happening around them. And they are realizing more and more they're out of control in terms of the forces they're dealing with us too strong and there's there's lots of maths geometry there's lots of discussions about church architecture um and choir placements and things which just appeal to me because i i love architecture i love you know visiting, visiting old churches i don't, don't, don't like old churches but in terms of there's a this church church architecture is designed to create an emotional reaction and so if you do walk into a cathedral, walk into St. Paul's, walk into Westminster Cathedral, walk into if you can see the St. Mary's or St. Andrew's Cathedral, the architect has created the architecture to give you an emotional reaction. And so people often feel like they're closer to God when they go into a, a, a well-designed building. And that's just the architecture play, architect playing games with you, which, you know, good on him or her, usually him. Um, it's not, you know, it's not as if you are any close to God because you've walked through a church building, but the architecture makes you feel like you are. And so I really appreciated the discussion that was being had about architecture, about design and music and hymns. And so for me, that sort of intellectual play really got me. But also there's just the menace of the warden who's there. There's the um, superficiality of, of one of the members. There's a, uh, you know, there's, we know that there's youth disappearing on the strets outside while the disappearance is happening. 
there's just creepiness happening all around. Some of the, you know, one of the characters is creepy as, and so it's just, well, what's really going on? And to me, it just, everything about that story just pulled me in and captured my attention. And the soundscape is just deafening. So by the end, um, you're just overwhelmed by the soundscape, by the voices, by the sounds, by the, the noise. Um, it's just louder and louder and just, yeah. So I, I was just engulfed by the story. Yeah. So overall, I think that the Amiga Factor, even though it sort of deals with the paranormal, it, it sort of also delves into the complexities of humanity as well. And and we get to explore lots of that uh, in, the, in this. So, uh, you know, when you look at science fiction stories like Doctor Who, um, there's less time to explore uh, those the the human side of the characters where we get lots of that in the Omega Factor as well. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. Looking forward to listening to the rest. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, worth doing. All right, we're going to bring on Louise Jameson and John Dorney in a second. But before we do, shall we throw in a trailer for uh, series one of the box set? So that's a great idea. <laughs> Help me! Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Listen! Omega. The last letter of the Greek alphabet. The end. In this case, the end of scientific knowledge. We are asking you to go further than that end. Beyond the end. To the Omega Factor. And further. Dr. Anne Reynolds, I called ahead earlier today. We're here from the Ministry of Defence. Adam, Tom Crane was my father. Here to lead us into temptation, are you, Adam? Uh, no, I'm here to tell you your church might be haunted. Ah, He's got the sight. What? I can tell. Like father, like son. Twilight and evening bell. And after that, the dark. I very much believe in the existence of the old gods more than you can possibly know. Let me have locked in! Her voice. What's wrong with it? And may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. The Omega Factor. Big Finish. We love stories. In 1980, me as an 11-year-old boy in Sydney, Australia, had a huge crush on Leela. So when I saw she was going to be in a new show, I had to watch it. I forced my dad, who also had a bit of a crush on Leela, to watch this show called The Amiga Factor. Fortunately, my mother didn't know what we were watching because there's no way she would have let us get away with this terrifying show, which I dreamt about for years afterwards. But I still remember how much I enjoyed it and how much it stuck in my memory. And it was when it was repeated 12 months later, I watched it again. So imagine my joy when 35 years later, as a young man, now in his early 40s, still with a bit of a crush on Leela, the Amiga Factor returned and just as powerful and scary as, night, as a nightmare producing as ever. So tonight we welcome the two stars of the Big Finish revival, the Amiga Factor, Louise Jamison, John Donnie, welcome to the Sirens of Audio. Hello. Hello. Listen, it's really great to have you both ab aboard. Um, just a bit of background. Um, on the Science of Audio, once a month, we do a random selection of different audios that Big Finish and other people do. But last month, Dwayne and I did something unusual, which was we chose a story for each other. And so Dwayne chose one for me, but I chose the Amiga Factor because I really wanted him to hear this box set because it's something that has um, had a huge impact on my life, something that I recall. And so we're looking at the Amiga Factor. And so I contacted you two guys and said, let's talk about it. So firstly, can I just ask um, Louise, um, what, do you, what are your memories of the, the series when it first went out in terms of the TV show? What, what are your memories of getting that job? It was very complicated getting the job. I was at the time um, uh, working in my agent's office as a sort of plan B job, and I'd accepted a tour. And then this came through and I was ended up slightly negotiating my own contract, extracting myself out of one job 
to put myself into another. It was all very um, peculiar and a bit nerve wracking. I was thrilled to get it. And we actually thought it was a series that was going to run and run and run and run. I thought it was a bigger break than it actually was. Mary Whitehouse put pay to that. She um, she was very vocal about what a scary show it was and how it shouldn't be on television. And and um, it was kind of the X-Files without before its time, you know, but without the budget. So we were, we were dealing with slightly shaky special effects. But that said, I thought the scripts were terrific and I think it had a lot more life in it than, than it, than it had, which is, you know, thrilling that Big Finish picked it up and ran with it. And, you know, um, John and Jimmy were just gorgeous to work with. And I felt very, um, they were very attentive. I felt very much the centre of attention for six months. And it was also the time I gave up smoking. I don't know why that springs to mind, but all three of us on episode eight decided we would stop smoking. And if you look at the episode closely you'll find that we all as actors start making very different choices where we decide to slip at each other instead of keep very calm and quiet (laughs) we were all a bit ratty through episode eight i can remember leaping out of a car in the middle of a motorway in a temper because they were teasing me and i didn't like it really dangerous (laughs) stuff but um yeah so i have very 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 fond memories of living up in glasgow and um, and, and in those good old days when we had rehearsal, you know, we had nine days rehearsal before we went into the studio. So everything was decided, decisions were made. You could go into the studio very calm and confident instead of chasing your next line. Mm. I've actually um, just watched the whole series again in the last week. And I was, it was interesting to see you smoking and everyone smoking all the way through it was you know, the first half. I, I, now you say, I think, okay, you didn't smoke in the last three episodes, but just dinner parties and smoking and alcohol, um, different choices that would be made today. Yeah, very different. It really is a sign of its time. Mm. And you said, um, you said that stage you're working with um, James Hazelton and John Carlyle. Oh. Um, the three the three were amazing together. And so is, is a lot of that report is because of being able to rehearse together and spend time together. Yes, and because we were on location the whole time, all three of us had come up from London. Slight resentment, quite rightly, from the Scottish contingent. You know, why bring up the three leads from London when they've got an an amazing pool of actors to call call on themselves? I mean, they did cast the net very wide for, you know, all the other roles within it, but um, the three of us were, as I say, brought up from London. That said, they were incredibly welcoming it just that it wouldn't happen now if something was being Mm. filmed by bbc scotland then they would they would um they would not bring up people from london to play the main part i don't think Mm. now it's 10 very different episodes i mean part of the thing that i think while so successful was every episode has a different feel to it so some of them are really very terrifying and chilling the second one in particular still scares the life out of me um, but then there's conspiracy theory, there's politics, there's all sorts of different play happening. Is that why you thought the show had a lot more life in it? Uh, I think back in the day I was looking to play, you know, there were a lot of headlines going, um, Leela now plays the doctor because she was Dr. Anne Reynolds. You know, I was given a, a grown up to play. I think that that's what really attracted me, that she was a woman of science and um, very well educated and uh, in control of her own life. In a, at a time when people were only somebody's girlfriend, somebody's companion, somebody's assistant. Um, and this was before um, Tenko, of course. So we were just heading, we were just heading that way um, for women to, so so it was a, um, a groundbreaker in that sense. Uh, so that's what really attracted me. And I don't think I saw all the scripts before I accepted it, but I know my agent was, jumping up and down with joy that was just the right career move for me at that time in terms of just character for Anne Reynolds I think in so many ways she's very different to who you are instinctively in terms mm-hmm. of she's very much of science she's very factual she has no intuition whereas I view you very much as a person the opposite you're intuitive relational people minded she was much more none of those things so playing a character who's not to type is that a exciting thing to do is it hard how how has how an actress to approach 
a character who's not like you? My mother always used to say, if what, whichever character, she was queen of the amateur dramatics, my mum. She should have been a professional, a really good actor. And she always said, you just find the nugget, find the nugget that's you and hone in on that and make that the nucleus of your character and the rest will the rest will follow. So I think Anne is compassionate. I would consider myself a compassionate person. She's kind. Uh, I consider myself kind. So that that's where we overlapped. Um, she was also very attracted to Jimmy Hazeldean. We'll say no more about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the education and the science side of her can always be done in research. Um, and uh, I think if you work hard enough, you're and the writing, of course, nerves you. If she she write she was written in in a very uh, direct way, you know, cut to the chase, and and her job was to protect in many respects. Um, so I think we overlap a lot, but she was definitely a lot more intelligent than me. I don't believe that for an instant. <laughs> but there you go. John, do you actually remember watching the original show? I, I didn't watch it um when it was first on. I was I was I was too You're young. young. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um but then I was able to get like by the DVD set uh when I knew that I was uh, cast in this. And I got hold of a copy off of eBay, I think, or something like that, and then uh, I gave it a watch. It was a, it was a really interesting one to watch from the perspective of um uh, of being a bit of a Doctor Who nerd, because the thing that always kind of slightly threw me with it was that all of the um, possessed by a demon effects look exactly the same as Doctor Who's possessed by an alien effects. And so ever so slightly have to go, no, 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 he, he's possessed by a demon this time. And and it's a slightly different thing. Uh, so I think it's, it's specifically, it's like the beginning of the episode two, there's a guy with like glowing eyes and a yep. haze around him. Where you just go, no, 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 sorry. But it was, um, it was sort of fascinating to watch because... Um, yeah, you, you've got, uh, I've, I've got a lot of sort of tolerance for that period of TV. I love, you know, the, the, the shows made around that time. Um, and, and then seeing something which was just a very different side to everyone involved and, and it's a different side to TV at that period as well. The, you know, um, a, a genre thing I wasn't, hadn't been terribly aware of before other than then as part of the, you know, the general, a, a general awareness. You could kind of sort of pick the uh, Doctor Who names out as, you know, looking at all the Doctor Who people, that oh, wandered yeah, yeah. through it as well. One one of the things I I, I might I might sort of throw this out because I'm going to have to rewatch the first episode for various reasons. But um, uh, I, I always kind of joke ever, ever since that I I, I never met James Hazelton. I have a faint feeling that we were both around at the National Theatre around the same time when I I left drama school and I think before we lost him. Um, but uh, but at pretty much any time I see him in something, I'm just going to go, well, "Hello, Dad." I just I just because <laughs> I, I think I bought um, Medusa Top which is this sort of Richard Burton film from the 70s that he he's very briefly in and is also very Omega Factor of itself. And if you haven't seen it, I, I recommend it as a very weird, strange, dark film um, that, that's, that's, that's look, interesting looking at. Recently, I discovered as well uh, that, that I, I went for a drink with a, a good friend of mine who's an actor called Maggie Service, who's just sort of been quite big in Good Omens too. And and I discovered that, that I'd not known this before. She's been my friend for about 14 years. Uh, her mother uh, was the actor playing James Hazeldean's wife, who gets bumped off in the first episode. Oh wow! Yeah, and and so I was kind of having this conversation with the go. This sort of means we're brother and sister, doesn't it? Technically. <laughs> anyway, which is uh, which is quite weird. So yeah. So with, with your film critic hat on, John, um, yes. how, how would you view in terms of the, the original series, what it was trying to yeah. do at the time? Oh, I mean, I, I think I think Lou's nailed it already. It, it is the X Factor before the X Factor w was, a, was a thing. It's got, uh, it's not the X Factor. That's wrong, isn't it? That's a, that's, that's <laughs> X, -Files. A, the, X, -Files. X Files. It's a very different show. It's not the X Factor. Though Simon Cowell is sometimes just as horrific. Um, <laughs> he, 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 um, yeah, I, I, I feel it's that. I feel it, that it's um, it's it's got those aspects of things that I think we. Uh, well, it's, it's just ahead of its time. It's got a um, big sort of arcing plot lines, but in a continuing series sort of way. Mm. Um, and 
and, and that kind of feels like it's a rarity there, particularly for genre TV, where it all felt a bit more sort of standalone as opposed to this slightly more um, long form narrative aspect. Um, so yeah, I certainly think that uh, it, 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 it's playing into that quite a bit, and uh, it, it's ambitious and clever and and dark and. And and yeah, from the set, basically, people weren't ready for it then. I suppose yeah. is the kind of the this way of putting it. Particularly, you know, Mary Whitehouse, who we've got, you know, who um, ultimately was yeah, not not someone I'd recommend. Um, I, the, I've, it's, I'm kind of interesting. Having brought her up, I realised I did get given as a present a few years ago the book "Ban This Filth," which I'm really intrigued about, uh, which is a collection of her letters. Mary um, Whitehouse. Yeah, Mary Whitehouse's letters oh. of complaint. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to read through those because I, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, not, not, not a fan. Uh, but I'm, I'm nonetheless, I think it's got bits about it beyond it as well, beyond the kind of the whole campaign. There was a film, wasn't there, um, about her life, which actually portrayed yeah. her in a very sympathetic light. Mm. I can't remember what it yeah. was called now. No, I know. But, yeah, I remember you mentioned it. Too. Which was fascinating. I mean, you could, you could, you understood where she was coming from, whether you agreed or disagreed. Yeah. You mm. kind of got yeah. to see yeah. her point of view. How, how did she get such extraordinary power at that time? I, I don't quite, I could never understand with Doctor Who and other things, the extraordinary power she had as a single woman to control what was happening in the media. I, I, I guess <laughs> just really good publicist. <laughs> <laughs> bloody mindedness. I mean, she was incredibly bloody minded. She wouldn't yeah. take, if the film is to be believed, just wouldn't take no for an answer for campaigning. Yeah, and and, and an enormous amount of public support. Weirdly, I mean, thinking about it, the person she kind of reminds me of, putting it in these terms, is Nigel Farage. <laughs> uh, where, where someone who has a thing that they just do and they just focus on and get in the papers and the press and then kind of make it their crusade, uh, if you like. Um, and uh, but he had a whole machine working for him, doesn't he? I yeah, mean, she was, yeah, she didn't have any of that. Was she political in other ways? I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, I get the feeling she's she sounds like really extreme right wing trying to control the, the um, conversation also the areas but was she like that or was it just media and what was shown on tv she cared about and nothing she else she was incredibly religious i think that was her yeah. big driving force it was, it was a um, pressure group yeah. In yeah 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 i think that the power of the church which obviously meant that omega factor would you know would clash up against it because it's you know demons and and evil but then in a in a weird sort of way well this is something um that uh that i kind of find w w w that's, that's the weird about this is and so something like say the exorcist or whatever and the exorcist is is a very sort of in effect sort of pro-religious film i mean it's not necessarily um it, it might still be atheistic but it's but it, it's at least pre presenting religion in a in a positive light and the the, the priests are the goodies um and uh, and yeah, when you've got forces of evil that are demons or whatever, then surely the people on the side of defeating those are, you know, it, it feels a weird disconnect. It's certainly because because I do find it was um, from having done the Epic Factor, there was at least one time I remember being a little bit. Um, th th there was one line I kind of I kind of thought was weird because it was there, there was one line of Adam being a tiny bit atheistic, and I thought I don't quite see if that fits this. On the basis that we have got actual demons and supernatural entities, so, and then he kind of goes, "But there's no God." It feels a bit w weird, in a way that it felt, felt like a bit of a Doctor Who hangover. So that, again, that's the that comes back to the same thing of like being really distinct about which bits are which. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? You know, th th theologically, that of course, if you've got the devil, then then you then you have to have the angel it's it's yeah. uh yeah. It, it, you are acknowledging a, a power for good if you acknowledge the power for evil yeah yeah, yeah. And if you if you are if, if it's a show with demons in it it is basically demons implies the existence of angels yeah yes yes so, so what the hell was she on <laughs> so let's, let's let's bring the show 35 years on now um how lou how did you first hear the fact that big finish had decided they wanted to do this I'm thrilled. I'm always 
you know, thrilled to work for Big Finish, but I'm particularly thrilled because I, I really thought the Omega Factor had so much more life in it than, um, than the BBC gave it. You know, like I thought Leela had much more life in her. And, uh, you know, the, it's proved true, both things. So, um, yeah, really thrilled. And uh, So who approached you and talked to you about it? David, originally, he was about to go and have lunch with Natasha, who was yep. yep. the daughter of the person who devised the whole thing. Uh in, and to try and, I mean, sweet talk makes it sound patronising, but to, you know, persuade her that an, an audio, that it had an audio life ahead of it and would she be willing to relinquish the rights and da, 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 da. And uh, he said, would I come and have lunch with them as well, not to discuss business, but just to give the event some gravitas? And I said, yeah, I'd be delighted. It was lovely to see her again anyway. And, and she practically bit his arm off. I mean, she's like, of course I want it to have a life. It's the most fantastic legacy for my father. And I want a part in it. Well, as you <laughs> know, she was without speech. So very difficult writing for someone with us. We found ways around that to make that work rather beautifully, I think, rather powerfully. Um, she does indeed have a, a very significant role in a lot of the stories. Mm. So, John, how did you get involved? I it, again, it was basically just well, it was a standard email. I think I, from what I recall, I think I was aware of it happening on the on the vague grapevine. I think, I, and I can't remember from where. Um, and then I think I just got a random email from David saying. Um, we've had discussions. We think we'd quite like you to do this. Are you interested? And uh, again, pretty much as what happened with Natasha, bit the arm off. Really, is this big going? Well, I'm not going to say no to that. Um, Even and... though you had to work with Lou, that wasn't a problem. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, it, that was the. I, I don't think they mentioned that in the email. They'd got some sense. It was, it was, <laughs> right. it was only when I was. <laughs> I they went. Oh, by the way. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I, they just kind of approached me. They said that they'd kind of like vaguely thrown around several names and then um and they thought well actually it's john though isn't it it's john and then, then just because they knew what i'm like and what i could do because i've been in various things before uh because it can occasionally be this weird thing when you write a lot but then they occasionally forget you're also an actor because i've been doing it for years I and mean, like 20 years i've done you know loads of theater tours and you know national theater and stuff like that so uh but but occasionally they can like pigeonhole. in fact actually obviously i started a big finish as an actor yep and to um, be praised but Indeed. you are, if I can just step in here, you are, I mean, you are perfect casting. Yeah, you are, well, I mean, that's you're so, I mean, apart from being, you know, gorgeous to work with and all, all of the above, but you, because your brain is uh, wired, wired, <laughs> because you yeah. have this ability to do 50 million things at once, you know, your brain isn't the norm, is it? And I mean that no. I'm actually slightly envious of your um, your your imagination and the way you can connect things. And I've only got to watch you playing a board game, and you and you just got it in one. You you don't have to be taught something three or four times. It's just there. You've got an intelligence that's extraordinary and an instinct that is on top of it. And not many people have both. I just think you're marvelous and. Well, that's very kind. Thank you. Yeah, well, I agree, and, and I agree you're, too. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> how did, can I ask, how did the two of you first meet? When did you first work together? Oh, crack! I don't know, to be honest. Um, yeah, this is the thing. After it's been a while, because I, because I, I, the, 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 I know. Well, I, well, I think I'm, I did definitely did a couple of Gallifreys, um, okay. which I presume yeah. it must have been around then. I think it would have to be pretty much around about 2006. Because I think the first Doctor Who's I did were about 2004. And then, yeah, like, actually, I flew down from the Edinburgh Festival to record one Gallifrey, um, oh, which I think was the, 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 the first one I did. Um, I, because we could do it in the morning. And I said, and I was at the Edinburgh Festival, I was going, I'd like to do this. Can I just fly down and do this? And and it, it basically meant I was paid, you know, a packet of crisps uh, for, for, for doing the gig, but I was keen to do it. Um, and uh, and I think it would have to be that, or the, at the very least, the Gallifrey. But then I kind of think that um, 
it, it feels like there's a gap in that because that's like briefly sort of passing through and then suddenly it, it feels in my head like it went from brief meeting to part of the furniture by around the time we were doing the initial stages of the, the fourth Doctor Adventures and like Energy of the Daleks and stuff where we just were going. And, when and, did you and, write yeah. Wrath of Icenai? When did you write that? That was, that was the first season of, of the, the fourth Doctor stuff. Um, because that's uh, when you went like... <laughs> onto my radar yeah. so, you know this man can really write brilliantly yeah, that, um, yes um, that that was and i think actually what potentially helped them was that if, if i remember rightly we recorded that the week after doing foe from the future right uh, so we got very different sides this big sort of six-part epic and then this big sort of this smaller more focused character historical um yeah. and but but and then also as well that it, i i think that that but obviously i seen i is one that was written very strongly well was conceived with you in mind for the obvious reason that, 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 that yeah, I went to, I, I was told can you do a Robins and Britain thing I went yes went to bed I, 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 they'd said if I remember rightly you can you can we don't have to write this immediately you can take as long as you want for it to come up with an idea and I went to bed that night woke up in the middle of the night the, and then my head just said three words Leela meets Boudicca and I just went yeah that's it isn't it that's that's <laughs> what, what else are you going to do beyond that um <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, I think I think that, but but yeah, I think I was always very aware of that point because I, rem I actually what I remember distinctly from that, I suppose, was I, I because I'd been doing the writing before I was doing that. I was I think I'd done Justice of Jaxa and Foe from the Future, and I'd been watching loads of the um, the, the old episodes of, of the, and I'd been like going back and forth between years, so watching bits, and I really noticed there's a couple of interesting things. So um, Sarah Jane Smith is almost entirely Elizabeth Slade in his way like that character. The character itself is barely there on the page, uh, but uh, but Liz is just finding edges and angles to it all the way through. She's doing amazing stuff. Whereas I'm kind of felt with Louise and Lido, kind of go, really good character, really good actor, uh, which which was just such a kind of exciting thing to play with. So I, I was immediately, when I was doing it on that sort of level, I got, I, it was the first time I really kind of got precise, I, I, I kind of really connected with them, going, no, no, this character is amazing. And has got so much potential that isn't always necessarily explored, and that is part of the led to I think that sort of thing. So I think that was it helped with the connection in the initial stages. But then I think it's just really good to work with. So you, I think everyone connects with <laughs> at some point, regardless of any yeah. of that stuff, because you go, oh yeah, yeah great to work with. <laughs> great. So can, can I just ask um, Louise? Am I right in remembering that uh, when the first series of the Omega Factor for Big Finish was made? everyone came to you where you were and it was recorded up near you and you spent a week, uh, all, everyone spent a week in your place. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> everyone lived in my house. I've just, after 33 years, I moved out of it last December, which was quite gut-wrenching, sad thing to do. Um, but yes, there were a lot, I'm sure John can testify to this. There was, there was many, uh, you know, half a dozen people around my kitchen table chewing the fat and they, and uh, they turned into I think really lovely evenings that you know went on far too long two three in the morning sometimes um but it, it's that thing of when actors go away on location they tend to bond much stronger than if you're all disappearing off your homes in London so I think it it made for a very good company feel as it were that, yeah yeah it's, I think I can go I think that's probably why feel that uh yeah what connected is a lot of spending spending a lot of time down there and would stay with lou and we just like yeah it, it kind of and it's not it's not world. a manor house it's a, it was is a tiny little cottage so people yeah. were sort of you know crammed into the attic <laughs> and yeah. sharing rooms and things it's not not a grand place at all but in uh but it is in a place of um exquisite natural beauty it's beautiful town formation rocks and a forest bluebell forest literally on the doorstep and as you say a beautiful town tunbridge wells yeah mm. so, um, it, but hey so, so lou when you came to a character 35 years after you first played her was there anything you came to how, how did you approach dr ann reynolds well joyously i wasn't um i wasn't asked to play her at 20s whatever i was eight when I recorded her, I think twenty eight. Was, um, was that was that ever considered? Because I mean, often Big no. Finish does set shows back in where it was set. So why why the choice this time to? Well, I think because everything? Jimmy died far too young. 
Yeah. May he rest in peace. Um, so they wanted, they didn't want to replace him. So I think it just fell naturally that we just move, we would move on a generation. And um, also, it's, I suppose it probably it, it it kind of matters less in a way because obviously with say Doctor Who, the, the Doctor dies every now and then, so you have to set it within that that time frame when they're nominally alive. Whereas obviously. Um, the Emmy Factor, we could just do another series, like a second series. Yeah. And I was delighted to be able to play. Uh, she's still a bit younger than me, but, you know, more or less my own age. So I think what that brought to it was a maturity, was a life experience, was a kind of patience that perhaps yeah. wouldn't have been present back in the 70s. And uh, because she'd been through it all with his father, she has a great deal of knowledge of the erratic and emotional behaviour um, that John I was brings I was going to say, it's one of the things that's um, uh, also quite useful from a writing perspective, obviously not that I've written The Omega Factor, uh, that you do have to be aware that you're releasing these things in 2023 or whenever it is or whichever year it is. Um, mm. And so... Sometimes you can write things that are nominally set in the 70s or and try to fit them into a 70s milieu where uh, there's a lot of stuff in the 70s and the 60s and 70s that's unacceptable, frankly. Um, and so if anything, it's a, from a writer's perspective, setting it now is way easier because you, yeah. you're, you're writing now for people now as opposed to writing it in the, set in the 70s for people now, which is, you know, I found that often with the Avengers where the, you know, where there were bits of the scripts of the... The missing episodes we had that I was adapting, where you'd have to have this bit kind of going, "Do we say this? Can we say this?" But being aware that that was a historical document, but there's yeah, the kind of vibes of that. Yeah, it's a real conundrum, isn't it, to be uh, mm. to be very true to the era without being offensive. It's very difficult yeah. now, really difficult. Being, being being old but modern at the same time is. Um, I thought it was interesting what you said when I because I have written a couple of the Amica factors and. Um, I remember having a conversation with you, John, going, um, do you want to hear what I'm thinking of doing? And you went, no, I don't want to know anything yeah. until I see the script because it's such a luxury for me to just be an actor on something. And not yeah, a it's delightful. Script. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to say, John, for you, I mean, Big Finish has a reputation for killing you very early on in lots of stories. Yeah. So <laughs> you've actually managed to survive <laughs> three entire box sets. Um, yes. And, and, and very much as... Got as got away with it. You two are very much co-leads. Like there's, there's no, I mean, you know, you know as much as lose always a star in everyone's eyes. You, you, the two of you hold everything together, and you, both of you are always driving everything that's going on in your plot lines. What was it like approaching, well, giving, being given a part like that, and then working out how to play a part like that, where you're not going to be killed off after ten minutes? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, if anything, it's it, it's easier because you've got a lot more to go with. Um, I remember, the, I think the hardest role I have ever had in anything was. I think the first job I had out of drama school, the first pay job, was in a production of a play called Flight at the National Theatre, which is a play by Mikhail Bulgakov that's magnificent. And I had one line, and it was the words, the station master, sir. And I, 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 the amount of times and variations on that I tried where it was borderline impossible, where I was going, oh, I, the, 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 the station master, I, I, you know, where you go, I've got no character to lock this onto. Um, it's and so it's really hard to find a way of hitting it naturally where you deliver and it was just like I, I think I had more direction for that one line and those three words than for anything I've ever played ever again whereas everything else you've got a character and you can find a way to explore it I think it, look, it's, it's the same kind of as anything else it's like if I'm doing a theatre job I probably do about the same level of prep but there, there's if you're doing a theatre job a theatre job is largely is so much about rehearsals and you're going in and you're exploring in your and if anything i would always say to people like for me it's always about finding the wrong thing and going no that doesn't work let's try this and 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 it, it, it's the place to make mistakes um obviously you don't have as much rehearsal time um doing an audio um we basically do rehearse record and and sometimes they'll use bits of the first rehearsal or whatever so obviously what you have to do is read it through as many times as you can and get a, a sense of and like I, what I tend to do is I because I, I work generally relatively instinctively, so it's sort of more I'll take it in the scene in the moment. As long as I've got a vague idea of the character and I know what the character is, and like I, I, there's so much playing in the moment, so you've got the spontaneity of it. 
because um but i will keep an eye out for bits of going okay this one feels like this is going to be tricky and making little notes along the way um yeah so it's just, that, that that's kind of the way i approach it but it's just like yeah reading through the scripts as often as i could in advance i was familiar with them um and so i knew where i i think that's the key thing for me it's knowing where you are in the story is is a very important part and so knowing what sort of pitch is supposed to be more than necessarily knowing it's on a, like a line by line basis and also to know what the scene before even if you're not in it if yeah. it's been a particularly quiet scene you want to come in with something that contrasts that or whether you i mean the director yeah. would normally have an eye on that but because you tend to record out of sequence so john and i would record all our duologues for example and then maybe the rest of the cast would come in a bit later um just to know where we are in the story, how frightened we are, how secretive we are, how so you've got all mm. that marked up before you go in. I, but the luxury of not having speak, to learn your lines. I, I will say specifically in terms of the Emica factor, um that sort of stuff is ever so slightly a bit of a memory at this point, because uh the the last one we did, or so the one that's just coming out in a in a couple of months, I, I was in so much of it and it was pretty much done in in, in direct scene order. Which was which was quite useful because I could I didn't have to worry about it. Every now and then we'd nip back and forth and do little bits depending on you know actual availability and stuff. But um, it was it was very straight through, um, and uh, and and Barnaby who was directing us um, was really on it all the way through. He's a magnificent He's director. He's such a good director, Barnaby. He really is. What 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 are my favourite moments um, in the last couple of months? Uh, this is just as an aside. Um, was uh, was I went to the cinema to see Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning, and I, I, and the, I think I must have got some weird looks for the audience because there was one moment where where, where Barnaby turns up. Yeah, I did the same like thing. And blur in the background behind Hayley Atwell, and and I think I'm in the cinema, and I, I go yay and cheer, and just this bit of going, going, what other people in the cinema are wondering what the hell's he? Hayley Atwell's just sat down on a plane, and and but. It, but it, it was a, it was a, enough for me to kind of watch that bit, kind of go, yeah, you, d you don't you don't just cast Barnaby to be like an extra in the background. He's he's a, he's a really good actor, and which made me kind of go, oh, there will be a bit more with him, and there is, uh, even if still non-speaking. But it's a bit more than an extra. But yeah, just just I had that with also with Mark Gatiss in that as well. He said another bit, but slightly less because because it feels a bit more of a surprise. And I, but the thing I, my friend who I was seeing it with was kind of saying, yeah, I got definitely excited about. That. I did him in the cast list at the end, and. And, and my friend who was seeing with was sort of saying, "Yeah, I mean, I think if I was boasting about people uh, I'd met who were involved in in Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning, those two wouldn't be my first choice." And I just went, "Oh yeah, I did work with Hayley Atwell once. Yeah, that's that's true, isn't it?" I um, got her. I, I was watching with my son. I went, "Oh, it's Barnaby K." <laughs> and yeah, my son went, "Who's that?" <laughs> like, yeah. "Oh, sorry." <laughs> I'll, sh I'll show you something later. Yeah, actual legend. So yeah, really, really good bloke. Yeah, but once again, amazing actor. Like no speaking lines. I was a bit sort of, you have to be kidding me. But anyhow, <laughs> no, it needed someone to him to do that to really nail the bit he did. I thought he, he it was really cool. Yeah. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, the Omega Factor Series Two. I will not be afraid. My mind is the path through which fear enters the world. Help me. Uh -huh. And someone walks straight through her. Look, there's something wrong, something evil. Has been a change? No, sir. They're both stable. Let me introduce Edward Milton. Milton. I remember. You're an MP now, aren't you? Dr. Wyatt. Dr. Reynolds. Let the angel tell thee. Tell me. Adam. Adam. They're coming. Back. There's something wrong. I, see nothing. I can feel it. I feel nothing. Riva, what's happening? What is it? There's something in here with us. Adam, help me! He must be stopped. He must be stopped. 1984, 1985, or 1984, 1984. Oh, no! Adam, help them. <laughs> stories.
Now, one of the things that really stands out with you two is just in terms of that chemical bond that some actors have and some don't get at all. <laughs> um, what What is it, do you think, that actually has made your chemical connection so tight in terms of those two characters? I would say um, I mutual respect, really. I think we rate each other's work very highly. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think that um, we, we we've we've always sort of connected. I mean, I think it does help with, as Lou said, that whole thing of spending some time staying in a house and kind of, but then working on multiple levels on different things. So script editing um, and and working back and forth with each other and that sort of writing thing, and as an actor, where. Um, it, we, ju we, we just sort of know how the other one works and it's all sort of in the blood but also it, it's as you say sort of a mutual respect thing on all those levels um where, and it's kind of loving other... someone warts and all really we know each other on that that level now oh. you know i think i'm i'm we've seen each other in tears we've seen each other you know unable to stop laughing we've seen each other angry mm. We've seen each other pissed off with mutual friends. I just think we've got that that kind of depth of friendship yeah. going now. Mm. And I think that comes across. I mean, I think Lou, you're both protective over John's character, but then you give him what for sometimes as well, in terms of when you're unhappy with him. So it's it's it, you manage to manage this both sympathy, care, but also this outright you're an absolute wally. Stop doing what you're doing. I think there's this kind of maternal thing going on as well, probably. You know, like earlier, it's like, why do you keep leaving the camera? Come and sit down. It was yeah. like, <laughs> stay with us. <laughs> just how I just how I would talk to my sons, you know. Just a question for John. Um, yes. Ken Ken Bentley, who doesn't write a great deal for Big Finish, wrote for this series. Yeah. Uh, an episode or two. Louise wrote an episode, uh, a few, couple of episodes. Um, did, was that ever an option for you, or did you um, purposefully avoid writing for this series? You wanted to concentrate on the role. Yeah, purposefully avoided it. Um, I mean, I think um, not. I mean, not initially, because obviously, I think when the writing started, I, you know, I might have been a plausible candidate uh, for the first season before I, I was acting in it. Um, but but I didn't know. But it, during that first season, as I say, I wasn't involved in the making of it on any level. So the scripts came to me with me not knowing anything about them. And I enjoyed that to the degree that I thought I'm going to try to keep this up. It means that I'm all I'm I'm only bringing myself as an actor to this. Um, I'm not thinking about, you know, ideas that we didn't pursue or whatever. So, you know, almost every other job. Every other acting job, pretty much, I've done for Big Winner, certainly in the last few years, has often been ones where I've been part of the process. Because, uh, I mean, that's like, say, the Sutek story I did for the Fourth Doctor Adventures. I'd script edited that. I didn't know I was going to be cast in it, but I'd script edited it. And so you uh, are kind of... I, I, it's For me, it was useful to kind of focus... Because of such a big part, it's useful to kind of just focus on that as an aspect of it. Just going, all I have to think about is the character. And I'm not... You know, in the position you're of like, also, worrying. you're not left hearing lines you've written land badly or not yeah. quite <laughs> as you want them to, or you yeah, know, you're yeah, not yeah. distracted in any way, are you? You're just bringing someone else's work to life. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, I kind of there, there have been a few times I've been in things that I wrote, and I've always found it this this so interesting thing where you're going, well, this could go badly for me on two levels. So the, the, the actor in me could ruin writer me's work and writer me could ruin actor me's performance. And you're going, just have to focus on one. Um, and it, yeah, just for me, it's a kind of refreshing thing. What I find interesting is at the same time, uh, I can completely so see why Lou is the exact opposite. Because most of the time, what Lou is getting is stuff that she's not been involved in the process of. Uh, so that's so. I, so the idea of having the, the freedom to go, okay, I can be a bit more involved in this and create this and, and drive this in a direction, um, is, is is so we're both kind of going against our usual thing, and it gives it a slightly different flavour and a slightly more sort of creative control. Where so I'm used to doing that as well. So I'm going, and for me, the break is doing this, and for Luke, the break is going the other way, and they're both equally valid approaches. But then, but then we just kind of pitched it in a slightly different direction. Being suspense and horror, one of the key components that make this so powerful is the sound design and the music. 
Um, and I was curious in terms of as actors, um, on stage, whenever you have effects, it's always, it's always being done practically. I assume <laughs> on film effects, you're at least being directed very closely in terms of there is some practical as well as later added stuff. How on audio, when you aren't having any of the practical sound there, how do you pitch your performance to get that fear, to get the sound design? You've got churches collapsing around, you've got bells tolling, you've got screaming ghosts. How do you manage to tune your performances into what's happening? You have to rely quite heavily on your director who will have a an idea of what soundtrack is going on behind you. Very often you ask the question at the beginning, how loud is the whatever it is machine throbbing or war in the distance or so you know how to pitch it vocally i i think that sound guys are incredibly underestimated on audio they're more than one extra character they can make or break a performance i personally don't like sentimental music underneath something that's very sad or moving i think the actor should be left to negotiate that for themselves and the length of pause and the poignancy of it however if the performance doesn't quite cut the mustard a little violin string can make all the difference on manipulating your audience into feeling the emotion that you want them to feel at that particular time so basically if you've got a I mean, there are sound. There are some sound designers that are much better than others, but it's the the main thing that a good sound designer do can do is get the pace right on a scene. Um, pace is everything, I think. Uh, be it fast or slow or uh, disjointed, it's still everything and it conveys the pauses or the lack of pauses can convey a lot more than the dialogue sometimes. I know in the um, first box that Ken Bentley wrote a script all in real time, um, set in a church, and I'm not sure whether you remember it or not, but everything's happening in that yeah. real time situation. But the sound design and that combined with what's happening with the action is very emotive and powerful. And it, the sound design is almost music in terms of what's happening in terms of the action and the way the sound is rolling around the actors. Um, so as you say, I guess it's just depending on what the, the director says, where the director is aware of. I think we said that at the time, uh, John. I don't know if you remember with that particular story that 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 this is a story that is not only going to be enhanced by, but is dependent upon yeah. its sound design. I remember mm-hmm. it very. Yeah. Vividly. I think yeah. Music as well. It was all yeah. done sort of yeah, or diegetic, or is that the right word? Dialectic. I never remember which one's which. Diegetic, mm-hmm. I think. Well, uh, I believe. But, yeah, the main the main thing I remember with that was the was the amount of times kind of complained about um, us writing long scenes, and then you go go yours is continuous, Ken. It's one scene. <laughs> yes, Ken's a great one. Nothing more than five pages maximum, and it was like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen pages longer, longer. Yeah. How how do, how do you direct an actor scene that just is the entire play? Well, in that one, we we did it was broken down into chunks, and um, and uh, I think that's the way of approaching it. You kind of find manageable beats. I, I wrote one. Well, actually, I think I've written a couple relatively recently, but the, I, the most recent one I did was this uh, sort of the robots with Nicola and Claire, and just the two of them. And for me, that was kind of going through the script and just trying to find: is there a break? Is there a point where I can just? cut the scene where it just feels like if they stopped there it feels a natural point to stop and then we've completed that body that chunk of text and we can move on to the next that so it's looking for beats rather than scenes i suppose and you kind of focus on that so it was divided into scenes but the you know with the note going this is continuous if you have um the luxury of time you can have a read read through first so everybody gets the everybody gets the story arc but that it's so rare that you have the chance to do that with the speed, I think that was the one we did in in order as well, because I think yeah. it made yeah. all of the sense to do it in order. Mm. I just say congratulations, John, on your unit script that came out. I think last month, where oh, you yeah. have two halves of the story all in real time, and the two feel like they could fit on top of each other. 
because you've got yes, all the sound was... effects happening one and the other. That was just an amazing script. I think I did. I think I did talk to Howard about. We. I think we were very keen to make um, both sides of the story match exactly. I don't know if anyone's tried to like run them against each other. I would love. I, was, yeah. I was thinking I'd love to do that to see whether it actually happens. But it, I, it I, must I, be I very close to we time. Both... I think so because I because I went through and did like a full. Like, I was counting words so many times on that one, and it was always like I had marker points listed in the script and going how many words between this and this, how many, and just trying to keep it all balanced all the way through. And there's a thing I talked about in, in this in the extras of like if I, if I adjusted, if I if I had a note and act in the first half, and I adjusted the script according to that, that meant I had to go and adjust something in the second half completely unrelated. So the the the, the, the word count was approximately the same. Um, which was sort of fun to do. I also did another one relatively... Well, well, one of the reasons that those are quite fun to write, in a way, I wrote something during lockdown that isn't going to be out for a few years anyway, which is um, a continuous, real-time story. Uh, but in contrast to the ones we're saying with this, it, it it's still structured like um, a non-continuous one, because uh, to the degree where I almost think people won't notice... Um, because it will it switches between characters, so you'll follow one, and then somebody else will move in, and you'll follow that person instead, and they'll go into a room, and then so, and so it meant that he was in loads of scenes because it's never in like one location. Reminded me of weirdly of uh, been watching The Bear recently, and there's the penultimate episode of the first season is is a twenty minute thing, but you kind of it took me about half the episode to go, hold on, this is a single shot, isn't it? Um, and obviously, it, one of the joys of audio is we can do something that's got the feel of a single shot, but we can do it in multiple takes. Uh, because you can just stitch it together and nobody notices that you've got like hidden cuts and stuff. But it, yeah, as I say, I would almost hope that nobody notices until quite a way through, even though the title is something of a giveaway that it might be if you've if you, if you yeah. figured out. That. <laughs> I, um, I miss those things all the time. I always get surprised. Dwayne just looks at yeah. me and goes, how did you miss that? And I go, oh, I don't yeah. read the credits. I don't read titles. I don't. I usually don't yeah. even look to see but, who's written it until I'm halfway through it and go, oh, this feels but, like a John Dorney. This is the weird thing, <laughs> the weird thing with it, I found, was that it was one of the quickest scripts I've ever had to write, because at no point did you have to stop a scene and figure out how the next one began, because the, there was always the bit where going, well, I know what the next line of dialogue is every single time, so it just, it, I, I like, I'd written about twice my usual pace because I, I wasn't having to find dramatic places to stop a scene and good ways of getting into a new scene. It was always just, you know, that I, I just did write the next line every single time, which is. <laughs> easy in comparison there's an Alan Ackbourne play I saw at, um the opera house which is sort of the set was the front was the lounge room and there's big glass doors and then a patio at the back and yeah. while you're watching the play at the front there's all these actions happening people drinking and talking at the back behind the glass which you don't see which and they keep walking in and having conversations and walking out and, and that and then when we go out for intermission we come back in and suddenly it's the, the whole patio set up at the front and the lounge room at the back and you redo oh, the wow. entire play again where from I'm the not, patio side, though, um, I'm not sure. This... I'm, I'm, I know a lot of Eggborn, and I know he's very tricksy about doing stuff like that. But that's one which I'm not wasn't particularly aware of. That doesn't, yeah, it's, yeah. it's got its element, you know, table manners and living together and house and garden it's, and all the conquests. It's, it's, but it's not quite that. That's yeah, quite interesting. Yeah, I find, I find it was cool because it was just a, it was fantastic it just to watch these cast play the same play mm. twice. Um, very clever. Um, Lou, Lou, I just want to ask you about, you, you wrote two of the stories. So how, how did you come to write for the second series, second box set? Uh, who asked you to do that and did you ask? Um, David again. No, David and the ever patient uh, Matt Fitton uh, uh, overseeing what I was doing. Um, I, I love titles. I know you said you don't look at the titles but he he came up with um the phantom pregnancy title which i thought was a stroke of genius which i'm very happy to take credit for but i have to give it to matt really um i'm assuming that let the angels tell thee was your title though that's very yes. shakespearean that's that was just you yes that was just that was just me i wanted Anne to have a love life i think that was um my starting point for that one and the second one was um the illegal so-called illegals coming into our country for which i have you know enormous sympathy and empathy and feel i should be doing a lot more to protect and help them that that inspired that story yeah. um i mean once again it's all i i love your writing because i, I can always feel you through it so that you know the advantage of knowing you a bit is that your know, your passions, your interests come through? Um, so as I said, the first one in terms of let the angel tell you. Um, once again, 
an older woman, sexuality, romance. Well, actually, what was it? Yeah, it's more than romance, actually. It really is passion. A um, bit of lust thrown in. Um, so what, what, what made you decide to actually take it and a topic that on the whole, most people will avoid. That's such an interesting question. I, I think specifically for that reason, because most people do avoid it, it needs, I mean, this, this, um, I think um, vulnerability is strength. It sounds like an oxymoron or a contradiction or a, dichotomy but it's actually the more vulnerable you are the stronger you become and the more you can influence and the more you can give people um confidence and courage uh if they see themselves reflected and the bulk of our audience are women of a certain age i mean that's true of audio that's true of soap that's true of theater and we don't see ourselves reflected nearly enough but we can't just sit there and can complain about that because you can't expect a 22 year old um, male to write about the menopause. Why would he be interested? Why would he, uh, without you know asking his mother a whole load of embarrassing questions, how is he ever going to know the answer? You've got to have someone who's been through it to be able to. Uh, I mean, I, I. I pluck menopause out just because it's so you know quintessentially female obviously but it's you know there are those subjects which are considered taboo that just need to be need to be flagged up need to be you know it's all right it's not an illness it's a it's a it's part of life and you know a woman in her 70s still has um you know very strong feelings and emotions and you can't be i hate that phrase stop being such an old woman i mean it's it's mm. considered not much of an insult at all it's like you know we've stopped saying that's so gay because it's offensive we've stopped using the n-word because that's offensive nobody's addressed ah oh, don't be such an old woman big girl's blouse these things are very very offensive they touch they hurt mm. but i'm you and and they hurt because our voice isn't loud enough. We're not strong enough. The use of the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going off topic a bit no, here, no. but the, no, the it's use not of great. The, C, the C word as the worst insult you can hurl at anyone is quintessentially mm. female. Of course it is. It, mm. it could, you cannot get anything more female, and yet it's the worst instinct, insult you can hurl at anyone. Why is that? It's because we don't have a loud enough voice because there aren't enough women writers. I, I think it's, it's no, it, I think a lot of what Lou is saying is exactly why I think, um, you know, diversity of, of, of writers rooms is important. And also, given what she said, also in terms of age, it was why when we did uh, Outer Girl, I was very insistent that it was only female writers, not with, partially because Big Finish weren't using enough at the time, but also because I thought it would be better for the story. So, they, you know, there was a moment where we were struggling to find um the, the the fourth writer which eventually became victoria saxton um mm -hmm. who weirdly came up in conversation the weekend because she's now engaged to maggie service's uh brother who i mentioned earlier so it's all slightly weird within oh. strange worlds was um but there was a point where i was struggling to find a fourth writer and and, and things that helen was saying well maybe john do you want to do one? i'm going i'm going absolutely not and i felt very much from a script editing perspective when i worked on those um i could there were uh, two specific instances uh, that I felt really, really rammed at home in my head. One of my, one of them really small, one of them big. One of the, the big one was the entire plot of Helen's episode and the end of Helen's episode, which I just thought I, I do do not believe any man would probably have gone to that place and pushed it into that place that it goes. I think it, it, it because it's written by a woman, it, it written by a woman, it is um, more daring than I think any man would have gone. It's an and extraordinary the other one, script. It's great. a the, it, yeah. Wonderful script. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Go on. Absolutely nailed that one, and it was amazing. The other one, and this this is so small in comparison, is there was just one line when one of the characters, I think it was, I think, I, I think her name was Claire, but I can't remember her surname, um, said at one point, oh, I'm just going to go and have a pee or a piss or something like that. And I kind of think, again, I suspect a man wouldn't have done that. Uh, and then that occasional, yeah, the thinking, and, it, and it's, I hope, in a weird way, it sort of changed how I wanted to approach writing women 
and but also really justified those decisions and was re really reminding me of um of why the diversity in, in, a, in a writer's room is, is really important because there, there will always be things that they, you know lou writes a story for survivors which i am so uncomfortable in but it's such a good story because I'm so uncomfortable, which is just the, I think it's the three, I think it's the four leads, four female leads. And they're having conversations about things that I don't ever want to hear women have conversations about and going off and having wheeze behind things. And it's, it was interesting because as I, listening to it, I was thinking, this is something that men would never write, but yet yeah. Lou has a freedom to write it. And it actually opens up men's eyes in, in a way that women have conversations that we would never normally hear. And so I felt like I was taken into a world that I'm not privileged to hear because, you know, I didn't realize that women farted and women did things like that because that's not, that's not what <laughs> women do in public. Uh, but yeah. Lewis is willing to open up the whole world and say, hey, have a look at this. Nick, Nick Briggs said to me that I'd put that weeing scene in on purpose because I always complain to him that he can get very lavatorial very early on in any discussion. <laughs> whenever, you know, whenever we're in the studio, the first toilet reference, I'm going, oh, it's only 20 past 10. You know, it's just like an ongoing gag, really. And he said that I wrote that scene specifically to, <laughs> to tease him. I think I probably did, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Because um, in, so in that first story you wrote, um, you really put Adam through the, the mental ringer um, more so than other people do. In terms of, was it just a fun t time to get you know time to get John in terms of this? How how much can we put Adam through the mental ringer and really make life hard for him? I think you did ring me up after you read it and said yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Lots okay, of yeah. honey and lemon needed. Yeah, I think that was a lot <laughs> keep of the local cause I mean, working. It, it's sort of my standard joke is is that that um, when I get the script, I gotta go. How much am I gonna spit all over this? Because uh, the, the, all of them were just absolutely covered in spittle. And and we're doing the, the one this year. I was gonna go. Uh, this year, what I'm gonna be doing mainly is gobbing over my iPad. That's that's oh, what. Please, I, it's just quite the <laughs> Bringing the sanitizers. No, it was yeah, uh, it was it was fun, and I I often. When I get a Leela script, for example, and she does nothing but run and scream, um, it, it's slightly disappointing. I always like there to be some deep character moving kind of relationship thing going on as well. But of course, basically, they're adventure stories, aren't they? You've got to mm. take whatever you do has to serve your story. And I'm afraid to put John through the ringer to serve the story, but. <laughs> Thing. it's not actually it's not a, a thing to apologize for really because it is you, that you as from an active perspective you want to be doing stuff um mm -hmm. and it, from from even on the most minor level i've always found that the days when i've got a bigger part just go more quickly because you're mm -hmm. you know rather than the sitting outside in the green room where it's nice enough having a chat with people be going like I, I could you know I, I could be loitering around wasting time anywhere whereas the bit i want to be doing is i want to be in studio doing the performance and when you're kind of in that zone it just is is more absorbing to me personally and um and and then then there's also the aspect of challenge in that um what you were saying earlier about Lou's as Anne being quite different from Lou that uh I, I remember to say I, I was casting in another eight born years ago which was called Season's Greetings and the part I was cast in uh Neville was the only one where I looked through there's about four or five male parts and I thought I kind of know how to play all the other four not sure how to pitch this one, which was a good reason to do it. And so that's the thing. You're always kind of wanting these things to go, well, what will be tricky to do? Because I kind of want to push myself and like find the extremes and see where I can go. And certainly from a writing when I've been writing for Lou, it's always that thing where you're going, okay, you've got a really good actor here. Give them material to work with. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of, you know, very much on board with being put through the ringer whenever. It's interesting, isn't it, that to step outside your comfort zone is often the place where you produce your best work mm. when you get a part yeah. that you can do standing on your head not that yeah i mean i'm being flip but, no, but some yeah, parts yeah, are yeah, easier yeah. than others it's interesting there are that... where it's easy. yeah there are somewhere it's easy to lean into tricks you've got yes uh, and 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 um and 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 take the easier options and and i think yeah the majority of the time it's going i want to find something different to explore rather than yeah. just do easy route i mean and, and i mean sometimes you know the easy route is perfectly acceptable 
um but um yeah a, a, a degree of challenge and, and kind of looking for your limits is is where things can happen that are daring and exciting Lou, Lou, I know you have a major passion for Shakespeare, and um, I'm just wondering how much you feel you channel Shakespeare in terms of some of your writing, in terms of you, you use horror and tragedy in a way that Shakespeare often does in terms of what he does with his characters and, and that, but you also manage to be so poetic. So a lot of your dialogue and the scenes, are, there's a beauty and creativity in your horror. Is that something that just it's just how you write? Do you think are you trying to channel some of your Shakespearean background, or does it just because Shakespeare's just part of who you are that comes out? I think that's probably the loveliest compliment I've ever had about my writing. So mm. thank you for that. I think probably fifty years, literally fifty plus years, of speaking other people's lines. You learn yeah. what feels luscious in the mouth and what can what can create the best atmosphere. So, uh, yes, and I think probably my writing might be considered a bit old fashioned now, but I I I think it probably is a bit heightened because of the amount of classical work that I've done. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure it would be old-fashioned because topically what you're discussing is never old-fashioned because, you deal, as we just discussed, you're dealing with topics that are very real, very now for people. But as I said, you just do it in a way which has a poetry to it. Just, you know, just Arthur feels... Miller, you know, writes all wrote all his plays in verse before he contemporised them. Right. Which is why they have this epic Greek tragedy feel to them i i would love to see those scripts to see how they are mm. but i think that so his 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 writing has that uh, that 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 literation quality to it that is it's almost it's like it touches the divine somehow i think mm. um and that and maybe that's because he sees these ordinary stories death of a salesman you know this ordinary story in this huge greek tragedy family drama dramatic way i i want to do i had this idea the other day maybe i shouldn't air it someone will nab it but i'd like to take a play like look back in anger you know a domestic drama and rewrite it using only Shakespearean quotes. So you take the yeah. canon and find a, well, you know, it's such, it's so yeah. vast, yep, something yep. for everything, and find the, the find the dialogue that would work. So, so, yes, you'd have you'd combine Osborne and and Shakespeare and see what see what materializes. I think it would be really interesting. Exercise. AI could probably do that for you now if you actually asked an AI. <laughs> Yeah, you know, only Shakespeare, using only Shakespearean quotes. Rewrite this play. Yeah, yeah. Now your second play was Phantom Pregnancy, which you've given away the credit to the title. Um, yeah. Now once again, it, as it deals with refugees, corruption, and the breaking of trust, um, as a, these are all passions of yours as a person. Um, how how do you find being able to write in terms of being able to express what you are concerned about as a person, and where where do you draw the line in terms of how much you should put on the page? I'm not sure a line should be drawn. Um, and I write better when it's collaborative. I'm not so good on my own. So, as I say, Matt Fitton was a fantastic guide for me. Um, and they were some of my earlier scripts, so I really did need a hand to hold. And he, he held it very firmly and helped me enormously. Um, Yes, I, I, I don't think you can write with censorship in mind. I think you just need to. Well, you, John, you call it the vomit draft, don't you? Oh, I, I mean, not particularly, but I'm aware of that as a thing. So, yeah, kind of like, like the, the 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 just um, pushing through it sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you and, just. Well, bleh. Yeah, it's always the thing that um, I always kind of suggest to anyone trying writing. You've got to remember that you know you've never seen anybody. You're not seeing anybody else's first draft in like a finished. 
TV program or a script or anything or any book you're reading. It's not their first draft, so don't compare yours to that. Uh, so whatever, I'm always happy to kind of encourage whatever your process is, but just never think, never look at your first thing and go, oh god, this is crap in comparison. But yeah, because you've not edited it yet. Everybody else needs an editor. Everybody else needs people to kind of say, look at that bit. That bit's a bit shit. It, you know, everyone. And and sometimes people get so powerful they don't have them, and we've always been aware of those well massive self indulgent awful things that people have written when when nobody is really willing to or powerful enough to say have you thought that maybe not that bit you know um so yeah kind of collaboration is always a really useful thing to have with that script the line i had or the two lines i had was there's an illegal immigrant from someone and then Anne responds some people would call them refugees mm. and that was a kind of springboard for me for the whole story and very flatteringly that was the line that was actually picked up on twitter when it came out and mm. somebody thanked me for saying the line um but deep down i was thanking myself for writing it <laughs> also I, I think specifically in terms of the Omega factor, we've also got to do a, a bit of a shout out here to, to to Natasha, who we've mentioned several times before, because Natasha is the rights holder and is effectively the control of the, these things. And and it does mean that in contrast to other things we work on, uh, where we've got to be aware of what the license is like, I think the Omega factor, more than almost any other big finished series, is one where you can pretty much say anything. Um, and and it can have a bit more of a political stance, it, uh, and and uh, we're in the fortunate position that, that, that Natasha is, you know, somebody I think we're all relatively politically aligned with, um, and but so we can address some of these things in a way that we you can't necessarily do so much in say Doctor Who or Doctor Who spinoffs. Yeah, or that happened occurred like, to me. That's yeah. true, isn't? It? That hadn't occurred yeah, to I've me. Always, I've, I've really noticed this. With the, with the one that's coming out this year, we're having these, all these things that, you know, directly addressing subjects. We're kind of going, yep, yep, this is, I'm, I'm glad we can say this. So, yeah. Um, I was actually, it was fortuitous that the, the week after Twain and I decided we're going to uh, focus on the Omega Factor, a press release comes out for Big Finish saying, new Omega Factor coming out. <laughs> um, mm. So, when, when did you guys find out that this was happening and why is it happening? Because, I mean, I, I've always been pushing for more box sets, but it felt like, you know the three boxes would be it so when did you hear this was going to happen and why why is it happening i mean for me i i, I think there, were, there were always whispers weren't there so i think a vague sense we might try and do something else at some point it never quite got locked as finished i thought it did maybe i maybe i'm misremembering oh, it I, but i thought i thought we were done and then it no, was I, a... I, yeah I, I always got the impression that the the willingness was there, but it was just a question of like going, yeah, but but it might be a while and might be kind of, you know, we'll right. see what else there was. Um, uh, but then certainly I think the first I heard about the, the the special was about two years ago. So it was, it was, it was long in the coming. Um, and, and I think it was just like checking in that we were all still interested and, yeah, before then, sort of Tim died to interrupt the script. But um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I think it was sort of stopped, but at the same time, with a with a willingness being there to continue, if the circumstances were right. Yeah, yeah, and everybody, of course, jumped up and down, going, "Yes, please!" <laughs> immediately. Yeah. So, what, yeah, what, what makes the circumstances right? Because I mean, as I said, this is one of my favorite series. What what suddenly makes this? What, what makes the situation right? Why why, why does why do they decide it's got this is going to make enough money to make it worthwhile? Not a clue. This Not is clue. one. Of, this is one of the reasons. Again, because I'm largely out of the loop. All I do is say yes. Uh, if they, they kind of, if they email me about it again, I'll say yes. I suspect I'm not. Um, I'm, I don't know this, but I suspect in lockdown um, that sales might have gone up on the old series on the one we'd already recorded, so that they just thought financially it would probably be a good choice. I suspect mm. that's what happened, but I don't know the figures. Yeah, no, no one knows the figures. But, but critically, I mean, critically, <laughs> it won. I mean, the first box had won, and they didn't actually win the Audi, but it was nominated, and so I mean, it was yeah, critically so well received. Yes, yeah, I, I, as was um, Attergirl, yeah. you know, finalists on the Audi. I mean, there a lot. I mean, Big Finish have done some. Um, just extraordinary work which you know we're all incredibly proud of 
And we get, you know, awards and we get close to awards a lot. Um, but the budget's the thing all the time, isn't it? Budget, budget. So there's there's some different names uh, in in this production too to the to the original series that was done a few years ago. We've got already mentioned Barnaby K, who's uh, who's the director. Uh, Rob Valentine, script editing now. So Matt Fitton was doing that with it previously, and a new writer in Tim Foley who hasn't written for the Omega Factor before. So how did how did this new team bring this? What's the new dynamic? What's that like for for you first, Lou? Because they are incredibly good at doing their research. It didn't. It didn't feel like we'd had a huge shift in our atmosphere or direction. I think if anything, we had a bit more relationship stuff going on. We could be a bit more um, tender with each other. We had a bit more private, personal stuff going on with some duologues, which I'm, you know, always grateful for. But it was a terrific team. I mean, it, it went. I'm touching wood here, but it went smooth as smooth. I hope it gets received the same. Yeah, I, I think for, uh, for me, it was a, the, the, there's a degree of business as usual because already I was, you know, it's all people I'm very aware of and have worked with on different levels before. So it felt, you know, like I was aware I was in safe hands. Um, but uh, I mean, the, the, the differences, if there are any, was that obviously the world has moved on in terms of both the scripts and in terms of the real life. So uh, the, 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 any differences, but there are differences in the setup and that kind of, if anything, slightly masks the differences. So, we get, so there's an a aspect of a different approach, but it's still connected to the previous one. Um, and it, it's, it would have, the world, of, it would have changed if, by virtue of the world having changed in the interim, even if it was the same people. So if anything, the scripts slightly take the brunt of it more than anything else, because as I say, and, and it's, but it's all people I'm desperately excited to work with anyway, so, because they're all just really good at their jobs. And Tim knows us both really well. He has, he has yeah. our, our voices in his head. It's, like, it's always easier. This is a trick you, I think you gave me, John, that when you write, write, mm -hmm. write with your dream cast in mind. Yeah. And then you've, you've got all your characters late, even if it's not cast that way, you've still got yeah. a very individual voice for each character. So when they know they're writing for us, it makes life easier for them. Yeah. Well, he's hoping it's a huge success and from it they decide we need another 10 box sets. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hold that vision. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so that's that's uh Halloween. Um yeah, so October. They'll be excited to see that. I was curious to know, because this is one story. So all the other episodes were an hour long. This is like a, a, a single story over two uh, uh CDs, um, or two hours worth. So was yep. did that did that change anything as as far as um, the storytelling went for you personally acting in the plays or was it just pretty seamless? I think we had to be much more aware of the continuity of the piece. So where we were coming from, where we were going to, so nothing got, nothing got um, blurred uh, um, emotionally within that. So the emotional journey had to be very clearly marked out. Uh, but I think that was probably the only extra pressure that yeah. I felt. If anything, it's slightly more relaxed because you've not got to get not got to like get through a week of it. It was just like come in, couple of days, bish bash bosh, gone. So uh, yeah, I had a very clear. I could see this one on camera. Mm. Maybe that that was be slightly different to the others. I could very instantly picture yeah. where we were and what the place was like, and uh, the empty rooms and the dustiness and the. Uh, tension and the, it was it was very it's a if you can say it was a very visual for an audio script well looking forward to it and well worth keeping an eye on the website there's no doubt there'll be some special deals come out just before it's released from the uh, original three box sets and uh listen th once again thank you so much for your time stories that we adore um, and I hope that yeah, people who haven't let, listened to it, um, as long as you're an adult, because they're pretty terrifying, um, yeah. it's really worth grabbing the box sets and having a listen, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, John. Thank you. What a joy. Thank you. There's something coming, Adam. Him, but not him. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions.
The Omega Factor, Series 3. There are CCTV cameras being placed all over my office, my lab, in the corridors. She was discovered asleep. Yes, you said. Floating half a metre above the ground. She's been suffering from blackouts. Wakes up, no idea where she's been, covered in dirt. You are about 12 weeks into the pregnancy. No, not possible. But horror needs support. She's getting... She needs to be seen for who she is. Her story needs to be listened to. Why are you here, Edward? What do you want? Pointless. Worthless. Without worth. Listen to me, Adam. I'm begging you. Don't leave me to suffer in darkness. I'm assuming Department 7 hasn't led Omega to what it's really after you. I wish for Jake. Dead ten years. I wish my mum was back too. There! Claire, you mustn't! You can stuff your experiments! Just send them away! Make them go! What's been trapped? This is a power. I believe in the Holy Spirit. This is a whole place is being torn apart. You will submit. You will serve. Immortality. Big finish. We love stories. Time to play. Well, Philip, how do you feel? Well, I always feel fantastic. I mean, just sorry. <laughs> yeah, Lou and I have been around each other for a long time now, and every time we get a chance to just talk to her, it's always invigorating. And yeah, we had a good gossip off Mike as well. So it's um yeah, lo- love it. And and yeah, John's enthusiasm and passion. So yeah, two 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 really two of my favorite people in the same space, and you. So yeah, what could be better? Th- I was going to say three of your favorite people. Yeah, three of my favorite <laughs> people, all in one place. What could be better? Very good. All right. So so keep in mind that the new Omega Factor release is coming out in October. Keep your eye on the Big Finish socials and feeds for more information on that. By the time this comes out, there may be even more information. There could be a trailer, but uh, certainly the cast list and production list has been listed on the Big Finish website. So you can go and check that out right now. So before we finish up, a uh, couple of recommendations. Now, what I'd like to recommend is... Yeah, let's hear well, it. No, I can't. I can't I'll do go that, sorry. on. It's, it's your turn. Go, Philip. <laughs> Thanks. I am going to recommend Box 2 and Box 3 of the Mega Factor. So can Good. I... Yeah, so um, I wanted to listen to everything before Louise and John came on, and so I've listened to all three box sets in the last week and a half, and they get better. I mean, I love Box Set 1. I think Box Set is, 1 is great. But box set two, um, resourced by Matt Fitton, uh, Phil does another one, Roy Gill, uh, and Lou writes her first story. Um, these, this box set has more of an arch happening over the four stories. So whereas they were much more standalone, the first box set, this mm-hmm. box set has some an, an interesting arch over them. It's not always clear what's going on until the final episode, uh, Matt Fitton does an amazing final episode in Awakening and ties together the other storylines and then leaves you with a lousy cliffhanger. And so once you get get into box set two, you've got to go to box set three to see what's going on. And the box set three carries on some of the themes. Um, It it deals a lot more with TV series. It's an essential to watch, but it's it's canon. I mean, the TV series is easily available. If you want to go and search it up, you'll find... Um, I mean, I have all the DVD sections, but for those who, who don't have DVDs and just have a tube of some sort, um, if you search it, you'll you'll get all the 10 episodes. Um, it does link a lot more with the original TV series. There's characters who come up or are mentioned um, or have an influence on these storylines. Once again, it takes us into slightly different realms so that you wouldn't be expecting from, um, which is the flexibility it does. And then box set three, once again, Louise does another story in that, which we talked about, you would have heard, but also the other stories are equally good, um, leading to a great climax. So strongly recommend um, Series 2 and Series 3. Very good. What about you, Dwayne? What are you going to recommend? Well, I'm going to re- recommend two things. First of all, uh, I want to recommend a podcast. Last week, I appeared on the Doctor Who show, and Rob and I were reviewing The Fires of Vulcan in celebration of Bonnie Langford returning to Doctor Who next year. So you can go back and check that out at the dwshow.net. Uh, secondly, I'd like to recommend 
Professor Bernice Summerfield and the Relics of Jag Sauer. We were supposed to do that for our Randomoids episode. I'm sorry. Um, but, and I did listen, I beg your pardon? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you are not. And I wouldn't be either. Uh, I listened to it in preparation and boy, I had it's forgotten good. how good it was. <laughs> it is so good. It is, it is crazy. Um, how you can get the Ketterwell robot onto an alien planet. I think it's really, really nicely done. And there are some disturbing scenes in that that I had totally forgotten about, uh, which which really upset me, actually. Um, which uh, it's the kind of thing you may not get in Doctor Who. So uh, a Benny Summerfield stories can have a, a completely different tone at times. Well, as do things like Torchwood now. Mm. But uh, but Benny was a forerunner, a forerunner in that area. So, yeah, I will recommend that. I, I do want to get to reviewing some Benny Summerfields, mm. but that's not going to happen till next year because uh, we've been talking today, Philip, and we may not be doing any randomoids for the rest of the year uh, because we've got something uh, special coming up with the 60th anniversary just around the corner. It's only it a couple of months feel, away. It will still feel like we're doing randomoids, but we're choosing them in a slightly different way. Yeah, yeah, we hope we can entertain you for a couple of months doing something with a bit of an anniversary, 60th anniversary theme about it. But stay tuned for that. That's coming very soon. So once again, Philip, thank you so much for today's episode. It's been great being in your company and the wonderful company of Louise Jameson and John Dorney. It has been and been lovely being in your company as always. Oh, thanks. All right. Until next time, we'll catch you all later. Bye, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 168. The Omega Factor, with our guests John Dorney and Louise Jameson, with your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. More about us and tickets to Katie Manning in Australia from sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to let us know what you thought of the episode or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.